long ago, a great and wise sage climbed the holy peak of Mount Abu. He sought the favor of the gods to protect the people of the earth. But he was descended upon by Rakshas, man-eating demons with flame-red eyes and fangs like steel. But though the demons neared, the sage was as immovable as the mountain itself. Though he felt the heat of the demon's breath on his bare shoulder, the sage was resolute, making the offering of fire to the gods and asking for their protection. From the flames of his offering spawned the Rajput clans, born of fire and smoke. Their heroes fought the Rakshas, but though much blood was shed, the demon menace continued to darken Mount Abu. The sage dug a new fire pit deeper into the mountain earth and again made the offering. From this pit came Johan, weapons in his forearms. He slew the Rakshas and from his loins came the mightiest of the Rajput clans. From this clan came my king. I am Chand Bardai, poet of the Raja's court. I will tell you the story of a great king. But this story, much like life itself, must start from the beginning. My king, Prithviraj, was not always a great Raja. Once he was a young king of Ajmer, challenged by his own cousin for rule of the Johan clan. In those days, the Rajput clans raided and warred with one another. There were Kshatriya, warriors from birth. A young Rajput like Prithviraj was headstrong and brave. But to be a wise king would take more than courage. From his minister came Basa. Prithviraj learned wisdom and how to rule. But the spirit of the Kshatriya would never leave him. My Raja longed for new victories and lands to conquer. Rajasthan is a harsh land, a desolate desert snaked by the winding fingers of the Ganga River. The Rajput clans who rule here are as tough as the desert soil and as passionate and unpredictable as the rivers flow. The name Rajasthan means the land of the kings. And from this land come India's greatest warriors and rajas. A king named Jaya Chandra ruled the strongest of the clans. His experience and might was surpassed only by his bitter anger and ambition. He sought to rule all of Rajasthan. In keeping with the ancient traditions, Jaya Chandra ordered a ritual signifying his authority. A mare was released into Rajasthan and pursued by the king's warriors. Wherever the horse went, the ruler of that land would either accept Jaya Chandra's authority or challenge it by fighting the warriors. As Prithviraj hunted tigers in the forest, he discovered how quickly the hunter could himself become the hunted. All of India heard tales of Prithviraj Digvijaya, his conquest of all directions. The Rajput princes submitted to him and word of his victories spread far. Princes came from all lands to congratulate the young Raja. But far greater than any princely gift was the love of a princess. In Kannoj, in the very court of his rival Jaya Chandra, Prithviraj caught the eye of Sanyugita a headstrong Rajput princess with bewitching beauty. The young king fell in love with Jaya Chandra's own daughter. My king was in love with Sanyugita. The two would sneak away from their courts to meet in border towns and wooded groves, where they would embrace under the bright light of the moon. But for all their secrecy, the romance could not be hidden from the powerful Jaya Chandra and his army of spies. The mighty king would never approve of his daughter marrying his own rival. Instead, he ordered a swayamvara, a ceremony where Sanyogita would choose her husband from the men invited by her father. Jaya Chandra invited all the princes and kings of India to the ceremony, except for one. Almost one. 
in mockery of Prithvi Raj. Jaya Chandra had a clay statue made in the young king's image to serve as the doorman to his court. Sanyu Gita was as headstrong as she was beautiful. With the infinite courage of a Rajput princess, she walked through the royal court carrying the ceremonial garland and ignoring the expectant gazes of her suitors. Coming to the door, she defiantly laid the garland around the neck of the clay statue of Prithviraj, declaring him her husband. To her surprise, the young Raja had braved the dangers of his rival's kingdom to slip into the ceremony. Emerging from behind the statue, Prithviraj embraced Sanyagita. The two rode to Ajmer as the furious Jayachandra vowed that his revenge would be felt to the ends of the earth. Without his daughter, Jayachandra became a stampeding elephant. No one was safe from his overflowing rage. But anger alone could not win a war, and Jayachandra would not have been a threat to my Raja had it not been for the jealousy and cunning of a once loyal subject. Oh, Kaimbasa! How love and jealousy made him betray his master. The minister who had advised my king since he was a boy, and whom Prithviraj honored like a beloved uncle, sought the one woman he could not have. Kambasa fell in love with Sanyogita. His jealousy drove him to Jayachandra's court to betray his own king. Whispering in Jayachandra's ear, Kambasa gave direction and purpose to the king's anger. He urged Jayachandra to send an ambassador to the Afghan hills to find Muhammad Ghori, a brutal warlord said to command a slave army numbering in the thousands. The messenger would regale the Turk with tales of the riches of Prithviraj's kingdom and whisper to him how the young king was too smitten with his bride to defend his lands. Then Gembasa promised the vengeful king Prithviraj would be defeated and Jayachandra would rule Rajasthan. Unknown to the two men, their fateful scheme would jeopardize all of India. Thousands of Turkish horsemen, the slave soldiers of a savage warlord, descended from the Afghan hills to the plain and terrain. Great clouds of dust rose in their wake, obstructing the vision of the Rajput Kshatriya. The Turkish cavalry unleashed a shower of arrows on the Rajputs. The Indian warriors, facing an enemy they could not see, could only weather the blows against them. With the battle hanging in the balance, Govind Thai, brother of my king, rode alone into the dusty fray, challenging the Turkish warlord to single combat. He struck Muhammad Ghori from his horse and wounded him. The warlord's slaves encircled their master and carried him off the field as the Turkish trumpets belittled a retreat. Prithviraj's victory over Muhammad Ghori proved to be a curse. Believing that the Turk would not return, my Raja took to revelry and the company of Sanyugita, leaving the defenses to rot. It is here that I, John Bardai entered the story and make my mark on my king's legend. I warned my Raja that nothing would stop the Turk. The warlord had come down from the barren Afghan mountains to gaze upon the wealth of India and would return with a larger army. My Raja was wise and he listened to me. He sent messengers to the other Rajput princes, calling them to war, but few listened. Laughing, the princes told the messengers that surely the Turks would not return so soon after being blooded by Rajput Kshatriya. The princes of Rajasthan sent only token forces to aid my Raja's defense. As my king marched once again to war, I feared that he would not return. I began to write this tale and shared it with the other poets. Even if my king did not survive the battle, his legend would live on throughout all of India. I would make sure of it. Prithviraj's heroism could not overcome his delay. 
he was defeated and taken to the Turkish warlord's castle in the Afghan mountains. There, my king was cruelly blinded and imprisoned. I followed my Raja in his captivity. When I came to the Turkish court, I regaled the warlord with the same tales and feats that I have told you. Surely I persuaded him. A generous warlord would treat such a heroic Raja as a companion and vassal, not as a prisoner condemned to a sullen dungeon. But Muhammad's heart was cruel, and though he brought my Raja from his prison, he mocked Prithviraj for his blindness. In ridicule, he threw a bow and a single arrow at my Raja's feet and dared him to strike at him. Prithviraj drew the bow. Though he could not see, the sound of the Turk's sneering laughter made his aim true. He released the arrow, striking Muhammad Ghori. The guards fell upon Prithviraj and slew him. In Ajmer, Sanyo Gita was stricken with grief. So strong was her love that she could not bear to live another day without her Prithviraj. In honor of her husband and defiant to the end, she took her life by throwing herself into a fire. Thus, my story ends where it began, with a legend born of fire. <laughs>